Good afternoon and welcome to the Engineering Talent Awards nominee interviews. These are brought to you by Equal Engineers. We are an organization focused on improving the diversity and inclusion of the engineering industry. And you can find out more information on our website. Now, this is a series of webinar interviews led by myself, Fayon Dixon, and David Pergy. We're in discussion with those who have been nominated at this year's awards. The awards were, of course, due to take place in April, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, are now scheduled to take place on the 9th of September. So I'm here today talking to Anne Stanhope, and I must say, all the links to our webinars will be available for sharing once all of them are complete. So please do share widely. Now, Anne is STEM Futures Project Lead for Defense Science and Tech Lab. We call it the DSTL. And Anne is up for the Returner of the Year Award. So welcome, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Fion. <laughs> How are you doing? I am fine, thank you, in my little office at home. Wonderful. This is it. We are all at home doing our best. You're not all zoomed out yet, are you? No, no, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a time. It's brilliant. It's a really uh, creative time and uh, a, a time of growth, I think. A lot of us are having to grow quite a lot and change the way we do things. Don't you agree? Yes, we're actually using the opportunity to get lots of things in place so that when we are all unlocked and back to work, well, properly in our normal way, hopefully, um, we'll have lots of lots of plans and initiatives ready to go. So that's really very exciting. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So um, do start by telling us a little bit what the DSTL actually does. Right then, well, DSTL, as you just mentioned, is the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. It's pretty well known in the country. We have several locations at two main sites, at Port and Down near Salisbury and Ports Down West, which is quite close to Fareham and Portsmouth on the south coast. Um, the lab's overall purpose is to de deliver the science inside UK national security. And to do that, we have specialist science and engineers, some of the best in the business, working in several technical areas. That sounds absolutely incredible. I mean, I've been down that part of the world, actually, to Portsmouth. I've got relatives down there. So you are the STEM Futures Project Lead. What does the role entail? Right, well, actually, um, my title is STEM Futures Project Lead. I work on two or three things, but I suppose principally the STEM Futures scheme is a partnership of 17 different organisations. Some of us are from government, some from industry and some academics from the universities. And between us, we are nurturing the capability of people who work at DSTL, but also across the UK defence and security enterprise. So we're trying to develop people in all of those organisations. We do that by using placements between each organization and educational opportunities, just to make sure that people are being developed with the essential and critical skills that are needed by the industry. Um, mm -hmm. Something else I do is a research project. Um, I look at ways to recruit people with STEM skills, but from different backgrounds. So two of those are STEM returners and military veterans. By doing this, we're using people with existing technical skills, but it, we have another bigger aim, and that is to increase the diversity of our workforce. And so we're always looking at initiatives that will help with that as well. Hmm. I really like that. I like the fact that you do source people from varied backgrounds because, you know, well, when I try and tell young people that, you know, the career that you might go for might not just be the only career that you ever have. <laughs> there are so many crossovers and transferable skills, and uh, it all is a beautiful melting pot when it comes to, you know, engineering, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes, we, we have people with all sorts of backgrounds who come in, but the essential thing is really that they've got 
the the STEM skills in the first place, and then we can build on them. Mm. Yeah. Now you are up for the Returner of the Year award, and I mean this award is aimed at people that have been out of the workplace for a number of years. And I happen to know your career break was twenty years. So. Can you just tell us, you know, why did you have that break and what were you doing in all that time? Okay. Well, I have always in the past, so going back to my first career, if I think of it as career one and career two, my first career after I graduated was really on the interface between engineering and science. I worked as a researcher making optical devices. And after I'd done that for a few years, I worked for several years in the semiconductor industry. I traveled to Europe um, really working on materials or, or marketing materials, doing technical support for materials and equipment in the semiconductor industry. Then in 1997, my husband was offered a two-year transfer to California with, his, with the company he was working for. Um, it was. A re I had great experience for working in Silicon Valley, as you can imagine. I was a semiconductor industry professional, done that for a while, but I didn't have a work permit, and so I thought, well, long career break in the sunshine. Um, <laughs> however, the two-year transfer became 13 years, and that was really why I then ended up with such a long career break. Right. Right. So when did you know it was time to go back into the workforce? Well, we came back from California in 2011. So that was after 13 years out there. I'd got two daughters at the time who were both, well, I've still got two daughters, but they were both at school. Um, and I was trying to support them. They'd obviously come in from a foreign education system, and we had the various challenges of trying to get used to the British system again. And for quite a while, I was happy enough to work part-time from home. I did some technical writing, which was really good just to keep, keep my sort of mind ticking over. Um, but to be honest, that's really quite lonely. I'd come back from California and I didn't know anybody here. And because my children were a little bit older, I didn't meet people at the school gates. And eventually I thought, really, I need to get out. I need to get back to work, do something a bit different. And that's when I decided mm -hmm. to find a job outside. Yeah, that makes total sense. When your kids are still at primary age, you know, you see the parents. It's like the school gates are the water cooler, aren't they? <laughs> you all <gather> around <laughs> have a good old yik yak but yeah I know your children are a little bit older so yeah. what were the biggest changes once you did actually get back to work well the diff the biggest difference when I first went back to work compared to my life as a school mum if you like was firstly having to get up really early each morning so I, <laughs> had to be up. I, I leave home at 7 30 in the morning to get to the office to get the car parked and everything and get in get all sorted out in the office um I'm usually home between about 5 30 and 6 but I think it's possibly more of a change for them they haven't got mum there kicking them out of the house to go to school they haven't got me there until dinner time really after they come home from school um, it was also quite a change for me, meeting so many different people during the day, quite exhausting in a way. Um, also, just on a practical sense, I need to have clothes that are suitable for the office each day. Um, yeah. you, know, you know what it's like. Yeah. Um, yes, it was really quite a transition, but a happy one. It's really interesting because... Um, that's what we're kind of going through again now, being at home, you know, um, we're kind of more relaxed. I think in the first sort of month of lockdown, I wore basically the same four bits of clothing. Yeah. <laughs> like, nobody really can see me apart from my husband and my stepdaughters. Um, and then it was like, do you know what? I'm going to need to start looking in my wardrobe. I love clothes and I love dressing up. So I started making more of an effort. I'm like, come on, Sayon, you're going to be leaving lockdown in your onesie at this rate. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was a bit like that. I was very relaxed to start with. And then a few weeks ago, I thought, no, 
actually feel like you're doing a good job to feel professional, you've got to dress a little bit better and at least dry your hair neatly and put a bit of makeup <laughs> on. You just feel better. You just you feel a bit more well-equipped. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. And, you know, I wanted to ask you about the challenge of not being able to get a visa you know, yeah. knowing that, you know, you, you want to move and get the work done. I mean, how did that affect, you know, wanting to get back into work? Well, when I wasn't able to get a visa in the States, yeah. um, that was a little bit frustrating because, of course, the companies that I could see around me were all the ones that I'd worked with for so many years. So the, I'd worked with the European branches of places like IBM, those really big companies, but I wasn't able to continue doing so in, in America. But after a few months where things were probably a little bit difficult in the I was expecting my first child and I didn't really know anybody, once I'd had the baby, of course it was a lot more uh, I began not obviously the school gate but mum's clubs and um, play groups and things and so I really got to know people a lot better um, mm. managed to get into that kind of lifestyle I suppose yeah the actual, the actual working was a problem yes <laughs> Mm. Well, I mean, you've you've just done so much work. You've really done some fantastic things. And yeah, I want you to describe some of the things that you've excelled in since returning to work. I mean, this is what the awards are all about. Please, yes. blow your trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I first came back, when I first got the um, placement at DSTL, I was placed in a department called DASA, which is the Defence and Security Accelerator. That is a really fantastic part of DSTL, as it's a fast-paced environment, and they're completely dedicated to finding innovative solutions to questions. Um, one really recent and relevant one was them looking for... Um, Looking, looking at faster ways to clean the inside of ambulances that have carried COVID-19 patients. So really important, really relevant to current work. And I did various tasks with them. I was given a relatively gentle introduction, but eventually started doing some work about measuring really how the different projects actually impact both the customer, so whether we can use the technologies that are developed or not, and also how they impact the supplier, which is the companies that are doing the research. To, um, but I was also going to say, I enjoy having a role where, where I'm in contact with different people, both within DSTL, in the different technical divisions, but also outside in a wider network. And that's quite familiar to me because of my previous work in the semiconductor industry. Absolutely brilliant. It's so, so great, especially what you're saying about, you know, being able to turn around those ambulances really quickly so they're safe for um, lots of people to travel in. So it's great work that yes. you're doing. So can you now tell me, or rather, you know, I'm interested, you know, are there any skills you acquired in your 20-year gap which you've applied to your new role? Oh, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because they're very different. <laughs> a 20 years working after children and a new role at work. But um, for many years, I've been involved in local education, local schools. So I did that both in California as on the school council. And here, I've been a school governor for probably about 10 years now. Um, before I came back to work, I was chair of governors for a really big all-through school in my town. All through meaning that it's both primary and secondary, so it goes from ages 4 to 16. It's got something over 1,500 children nowadays. And I had quite a lot of challenges in that time as Chair of Governors. We had an Ofsted inspection. We were successful in that. That was overall, I suppose, a good but challenging experience. And I had to lead the governing bodies through that. And more challenging than that, actually, we had a head teacher recruitment process, and um, that was something which took several months. 
it had to be done correctly. I was really aware of the pressure there of getting it right because you've got somebody, you're recruiting somebody who is so responsible for the education of that number of children. So we had to get the right outcome. And in doing that, I learned a lot about how teams of people work together. It kept kept my skills refreshed and I, it certainly helped me in my new working life pulling together the partners in the STEM Futures scheme, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I think there have been some transferable skills. I think so, because, you know, it's so valuable bringing up children and you learn so much. The art of diplomacy, negotiation, you know, <laughs> how teaching, you know, it, it's, it's a constant thing, you know, raising yeah. kids. You learn so many great skills. And so, you know, I know that since having stepdaughters for the last 10 years, I've learned so many skills um, helping to bring them up that I have definitely used in the workplace. So nothing is ever wasted. <laughs> it really isn't. So I know you're really passionate about diversity and inclusion. And you, we've spoken just a little bit about school. But I want to find out why it's so important for you to want to raise the number of girls into STEM careers? Well, I think to explain, I have to look back to my own history a little bit. So when I was at school, which is going back a few years now, um, but there wasn't a great ex expectation really that a girl would follow a career in science and engineering. I was one of three girls in my O-level class. There were 35 of us in the class and only three girls. And I was the only one in the school who took technical drawing at O-level that year. Then when I was at university, the ratio was about 1 in 12. Now, I was actually checking this morning. Most subjects, things have moved on a bit. But um, the statistics say that fewer than 1 in 5 students in engineering, technology, or computer sciences now are female, which is still mm. a very poor ratio. And there's so Absolutely. many reasons. I, I really think there are many reasons to increase the number of female engineers. There's the advantages that diverse, diversity of ideas bring, bring, and the fact that we're missing out on so many great people if we don't include women in the workforce to a greater extent. Um, I really think, though, that to increase the number of female graduates in technical and scientific subjects, we need to first look at A-level and increase the number of girls taking physics, math, computer science at A-level. And to do that, they've obviously got to do well lower down the school. So um, going back to my work as a school governor, I'm the careers link governor at school, and I work with them to make sure that all pupils get the opportunity to explore the whole variety of careers and all the options that science and technology bring. I think it starts even before that, if you don't mind me saying, with regards to how little girls play. And, yes. you know, when I, when, I, when I was a little girl, I had nothing but loads and loads of dolls and it was all about dressing them up. It was all about cooking and there's a baby doll and doing the hair and then eventually makeup and stuff. And, you know, I'm pleased to know that there's the Lottie doll out there. Have you seen the Lottie doll? I haven't. No, no. She's, oh, she's great. So Lottie doll, I always see her when I um, go to engineering events and she's like a, um, like a, you know, like a doll, like a Cindy doll, but yeah. she's in different guises of engineering outfits and she has a profile. She's a mechanical engineer. She's a structural, you know, a mechanic. Yes. She is an architect. And, uh, I mean, there's more books that are coming out now as well for younger girls, which are aimed at them specifically so that they know it's okay for them to yes. want to play with Lego and stick or bricks and build. <laughs> and, you know, it's absolutely fine. And, you know, I used to always want to play with my cousin's action man because he he had the really cool Jeep, you know. So, you know, oh, I got yeah, my the action men were great. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. And you know, I played the scale electrics as a kid because my neighbour Alistair had it. And you know, there's all that. So I did a lot of you know, sort of boys' toys as well. And um, I was an only child, so there was all of that going on. But it has to start. 
from, you know, getting rid of the pink and blue, girls anywhere pink, boys anywhere blue, you have to play with this kind of toy because it sets a it sets a subtle seed in the child in the child's mind from a very early age that they have to follow a certain path and we know it's just not true. Oh no. no. And I completely am with you on getting rid of the pink and getting rid of things labelled girl and labelled boy. That really annoys me more than anything. Although if I look back to when I was a kid, I don't think everything was pink. I think things were other colours. I, I think the pink is a kind of 80s, 90s kind of thing. And Actually, I think you're right. I think yellow was a thing. I think yellow was a thing when I was younger. Really, but now I think we're beginning to we're beginning to work our way through that, and hopefully, um, with various campaigns like the Let Let's Toys Be Let Toys Be Toys campaign, we'll um, we'll sort of begin to break through that and make girls realise that they can equally play with trains or cars or whatever. They can build things. I mean, what fun building things! But in the same Absolutely. way, of course, you have to bring through boys, the nurturing side of boys. There's no reason yes. not to do that as well. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. It, you know, education is for all. There shouldn't be any boundaries in how you go about learning. You know, there is a responsibility to the parents and the teachers, the government, to make sure that everybody gets an inclusive and diverse education and then they can choose what they excel in, you know, not be told that they should. <laughs> Got that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And you're right, if we don't get that perspective from different, um, you know, different uh, genders and, you know, it's just, it's a waste. You know, people are wasting away doing uh, things that they don't want to do because they never knew they had the opportunity to do them. Yeah. So let me ask, I was going to say, I wanted to ask you about more traditional, rather non-traditional methods that you use to attract and recruit. What do you do? Well, the non-traditional methods that I can really talk to you about is, um, an organisation called STEM Returners and DSTL has now run two recruitment campaigns with STEM Returners. They're a scheme that specifically looks at recruiting people with a STEM background but who've taken a career break for any reason. So like for me it was child's or family reasons you could say, others it could be looking after um, elderly parents, it could equally be for health reasons, redundancy, other causes, any reason why somebody is having difficulty returning to the workplace. And the idea is that STEM Returners introduces a group of people to an organisation and they attend an event as a group where they can find out more. And in my case, we had very, very informal interviews. If the interview is successful, the organisation offers the candidate a placement. So we did a 12-week placement. It's got to be proper work that's worthy of going on the CV and with a proper salary. There's no promise that you'll get a permanent job after 12 weeks. But in practice, I think the success rate is something like 96%. So it's a really high rate of people who go, have the placement then go on to get a permanent role. So I said the SDL has run two campaigns in this way. Well, the first campaign, I was one of the successful people taken on. So that was really great for me. There were six of us who were taken great. on. And then last December, December 2019, I organised an event because by then I'd moved into my new department, into STEM Futures. So I organised the next event, and that resulted in seven returners being offered placements. Wow. So we've had the first two have actually joined. Um Unfortunately, we got locked down before the other five could join, but we're hoping that they'll be able to do, um, start with us very soon. Yes. Yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? It's um... <laughs> it people in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. But, um, okay, so with regards to those five, they're just on ice at the moment, and you're going to get back to them. 
that on ice. There's, I think um, we're, we're doing different things. I, there is now a way that you can join, I believe, without actually coming onto site. So they can okay. use like a computer and everything and do all the induction. But it doesn't really replace meeting your, your colleagues, does it? <laughs> it's starting, no, it's starting so. a new technical job without being able to go onto site is always going to be quite challenging, I think. But you can do some reading, get, get the mandatory mm -hmm. training out of the way. So, that's uh, right, that's it, because we're all currently social distancing whilst yeah. working. And, you know, it's not your first time, so, I mean, you can really encourage them to, you know, getting, helping them get into their role and make a start. Yeah. But you, yeah. you worked on yeah. for many years, didn't you? I did, yeah. So when I worked in America, I I did finally, I, having lived in America for what? It must have been getting on for seven or eight years before I got a work permit. But eventually I did get a work permit. All sorts of things got in the way at the time, as you can imagine. You know, there was 9-11 and all sorts of things that really meant that they tightened up on work permits and visas. But eventually I managed to get a job where I was working as a technical writer from home. And that was actually quite similar to this, but even more isolated in a way. Because um, in that job, I was working in California, but my boss was in Germany. And I'm pretty sure it was about three years that I was working before I met my boss, which was very oh, nice, actually. <laughs> that is strange. Yes, it, it did work well because... I was more or less like the night shift for their team. So the yeah. team in Europe would do their work during the, the European day and then I'd be able to take over at night and get some writing done so that they had it the following morning. So it actually worked right. really quite well. Okay, excellent. I mean, I'm all for varied hours. Um, I've always I remember walking to school, secondary school, and just thinking... I would love to start school at 6 a.m. and be out by 11, 11, 12 tops. I remember having this dialogue with myself as I used to walk to school because I love the mornings and I think get get that done and then you've still got the rest of the day. You know, not everybody yeah. wants to work at a certain prescribed time. Some people work better at different times of the day, don't they? Yeah, and actually that's one of the great things about DSTL as well. We we do have flexible hours. So obviously there is a kind of expectation that you'll be available for meetings as as needed and things, but we do work flexible flexible times so that once I've done my 37 hours in a week, I know that anything more than that that I work goes into the flex the flexi time pot. And mm. if I work up enough hours, I can take an afternoon off or a day off, which is really nice. And that's yeah. certainly a change from when I worked in the past. So my my first career, if you like, you'd work all hours. No, I would never leave the office before about seven in the evening. Oh. Um, you never, and you didn't get any credit for it. You just had to get the job done, didn't you? Mm. The way mm. things worked. Yeah, I mean, it, the working environment is it's a tough one and, uh, you know, it's made up with so many different types of people and, you know, here at Equal Engineers, we're all about identifying and talking about, you know, inclusion and diversity and yeah. adversity, of course. So yeah. what kind of adversity have you had to overcome in your role as a returner? Um, well, I think immediately before I returned, the, the biggest problem for me was that I would apply for jobs, and I applied for ever such a lot of jobs, but I wasn't getting interviews. Um, in fact, I wasn't getting a reply, let alone an interview most of the time, and that was really very discouraging. Um, and I think you just needed to have the tenacity and the... To, to keep on trying and to, to kind of think to yourself, well, I know that I can do this work, but obviously they're finding somebody else who they think is a better fit each time. But that's really very difficult. 
So it's that constant sort of, again, dialogue with yourself, that motivator, that cheerleader, that encourages you from within, that says, you are capable. It's just that, you know, at this time, it's just not for you. It's not your moment. But keep going. It, it will happen for you. And that's very powerful to be your own cheerleader, isn't it? You you have to, but also I think it's very difficult without something giving, some some kind of change, because if you can't mm-hmm. talk about that recent experience, you know, when, when recently did you have to have a difficult conversation in your team, for example, it's very mm-hmm. difficult to get an interview if that's one of the questions, um, mm-hmm. and you really haven't got that um, experience. Unless you can dredge it up from your, you know, from your voluntary life or something like that, that yeah. kind of thing is going to be very difficult. And for me, STEM returners was the difference. Once I found STEM returners, they really were able to give me a lot more confidence, and um, that was that was a huge help. They said, "Well, where would you like? Where would you like to work? What would you like to do?" Um, have you thought about this company? Have you thought about this company? Oh, oh, right. What you mean? There's actually a chance for me there, and that was so much more encouraging. They did a lot by phone rather than with a detailed um, application form, all very light touch. And then um, the the short interview at DSTL followed by the the 12 week placement made all the difference to certainly me and I think the rest of the, my colleagues who joined at the same time. Mm. Sounds like you've got a really great team. What are you most proud of with working with them? Um, well, obviously, I'm very proud to work for DSTL because it's an organization that does such vital and cutting edge work for our country. That's something I never expected that I'd be doing. I'm proud of the STEM Futures program. We've put that together. It's grown really fast over the past year or so, but it's helping to develop the the capabilities in people that we need, not just ourselves in the STL, but right across UK defence and security. Um, And, of course, I'm also proud to be able to give others the chance to return in the way that I did. Yeah, it's it's so <laughs> it's fantastic because you know you, you speak or you hear from a lot of people that get to a certain age or they've had kids and they're out of it for a while or they've had an illness and they've not been able to be at work but now's the time for them to go back and there's so much there internally that can stop you but also outwardly as well so so here you've got this great team and great resources is really refreshing it really is so speaking about people who you know have had long career breaks how would you encourage anyone who's looking to return back to work um well i think the first message has got to be don't give up it's not always easy it's not always quick to find something but definitely don't give up i'd also really recommend contacting an um stem returners or an organization like that um they've got so much practical advice to offer they've potentially got leads into a partner organization as they've got so many contacts within the industry they've got campaigns running with different companies all the time um if there's nothing around immediately then don't lose time do do some volunteer work be a school governor do something of that kind or capitalize on whatever interests you have to stay active and involved and maybe pick up some useful skills as well yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. It's staying active. And sometimes if you can't get in or rather back to where you were, then definitely, you know, learn something new because you have that whole transferable skills thing. Nothing is ever wasted, ever. <laughs> no. um, and also I, I would say that the work that I do now is very different to the work that I did in my first career. Yes, I started mm-hmm. in research, which is similar to what some of the people at DSTL are doing. <laughs> Um, so I can, so I've got the kind of language that I can talk to them. I I know what's going on, 
but also by the work that I did in the semiconductor industry, it was really good background, but it's not related to what I'm doing at the moment. You have to be quite mm -hmm. flexible. And now I'm doing development in other people, and it's not something I ever expected to do, but it is actually very, very fulfilling and rewarding, and it it marries very nicely with my interest in education. Mm, brilliant. Their best. Absolutely. So speaking of best, you are of course up for the uh, Return of the Year Award. I mean, what would it mean to you to actually win this category? Mm, well, I'd be absolutely honoured to win, of course. Um, I think that, as we've been saying, returning to work has shown me that my experience and skills are still relevant and useful even after quite a bit of time and that applies to other people who've taken a career break as well so I'd really like to raise the profile of schemes like STEM returners um, and really to be able to say to people this is something that you can do and that would be useful to me yeah absolutely Anne, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you and hearing about, well, you shared a bit of a lot of your life, actually, with us, so thank you. It feels like it. <laughs> 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 okay, you're very welcome, and yes, so fingers crossed, and hope to meet, I hope to meet you in September. Absolutely right, absolutely right. I'm looking forward to all getting together and seeing you all at this ceremony. So thanks again for joining us today. Thank you so much. We are all out of time. Thank you, Anne. Um, I will be up next. My next interview will be with Cameron Ingram. So do check us out, please. And of course, do share our wonderful webinars and uh, keep watching. And of course, like Anne was saying, we do look forward to being together in September at the awards ceremony. And just a massive thank you to you guys for listening in. And I hope you enjoyed this webinar. See you.